phone's up. All right, this is Greg Kimball with the Final Percent Podcast. Again today, we've got one of uh, Denver's best businessmen and a brother of one of my brothers, Kyle Henderson. Brian Watson, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We're excited to be with you. Absolutely. Well, so maybe just give give everyone who is listening a little bit of a background on on who you are, kind of just the the cliff notes of of what is a Brian Watson. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a Brian Watson is, but I'll try to do what I can. Um, so yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I grew up on the western slope of Colorado, a little town of Olathe, known for its sweet corn. And everything about the western slopes in my blood and appreciation of the outdoors awesome. and love of the outdoors, etc. Went to school up in Boulder, got a degree in real estate, and then was a broker for seven years with Cushman and Wakefield, trying to learn okay. the business and meet the right people. And then almost 20 years ago now, I founded my company called North Star Commercial Partners. Oh, that so, so that people have context, maybe give them a little bit of what is what is North Star. Yeah, absolutely. So I founded the company above Ted's Montana Grill on Larimer Square, for those that are familiar <laughs> with downtown Denver. And um, I had saved up a little bit of money and said, you know what, I'm going to take a step backward for a giant leap forward. There you go. And I really wanted to focus on working with corporations on their excess real estate. So the first large transaction that I did, I went into the Benjamin Moore Paint Company. They had sold off to Berkshire Hathaway to Warren Buffett. And I bought all their excess real estate coast to coast in America in five oh, different wow. cities. And uh, since then, uh, we've bought from a lot of corporations you would know and many you've never heard of. So we're in three primary lanes as a company. Lane number one, buying vacant and distressed commercial real estate assets all throughout America to try to create jobs and opportunity and empower Americans. Uh, The second lane we're in is we work with corporations to buy or build facilities for them all around the country. And we own everything from daycare facilities to senior care facilities in five different states to large data centers for a very large company you would know uh, and a host of other assets. And then the final lane we're in is we have investment funds uh, where we go out and sometimes deploy capital or looking for income generating returns. Oh, wow. That's, well, you, you definitely know what your business does. <laughs> I that's do a, on a good day. As the founder and CEO, I should. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing. So um, one thing I know I, I've gone to a few of your Opportunity Coalition um, events and uh, there was, uh, I got this book, um, The Seven Rings. Yes. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about that. Who is it for? Where can they find it? Absolutely. So I wrote the book uh, a few years ago, and I asked this question about, you know, what is at the center of your life and how do you um, kind of program your life and what's important to you? And so for me, I developed these seven rings a number of years ago. And um, at the center of my life is faith and then the relationships and community and the environment, a host of other things. But the final and seventh ring is my business. And looking at me, you would think business may be number one in my life or number two. It is very important to me, but it's not the sole reason for my life. And so I encourage people in that book to ask those questions of themselves. I donate 100% of the proceeds away. They can buy it on Amazon if they'd like. And uh, I actually just wrote a second book that's going to be published here in the next few months. Okay. And tell us a little bit about that book. What's yeah. Who's that for? <laughs> well, you know, the first book was about legacy and, and faith and kind of designing your place in the world and encouraging people to ask those questions. This second book is the book that I wish people would have given me when I was in high school or college or just starting my business. And it's called Building the Lessons Learned in Real Estate and Life. And so this will be the first podcast to hear about it. So all those listeners, you're on the cutting edge. There you go. And um, it's these chapters that go through about lessons I've learned in real estate investments, running a company and relationship building, et cetera. And I just want to encourage people to hopefully garner some lessons that I've learned that would hopefully, hopefully help them in their journey as well. Oh, that's awesome. So if if we have that uh, consummate entrepreneur who's trying to stretch himself and become more out there somewhere, and you could go back, and let's say that you're that entrepreneur, if you could go back and tell yourself a couple things, maybe even these are things that are straight <laughs> out of your book, yeah. um, what are some of the things that you think are important for young entrepreneurs um, more specifically in today's day and age, what, do you th- what, what are some of the principles and lessons that, that you want people, I, I struggle to say kids, but you want people, the, the new entrepreneur, what do you think that they should think about, know, do, investigate, understand, just experience 
everything's on the table. Yeah. What would you like to have them connect with? Well, the first thing I would uh, do is to encourage them. You know, being an entrepreneur, it's a, it's a sexy thing right now to go out and start your own company. <laughs> we were talking about that before. And it is exciting. And, and to encourage them that this is an unbelievably exciting journey. And yeah. to go make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and to be authentic about it. Specifically the seventh reason. Yeah, exactly <laughs> the seventh reason. But uh, to make sure that they go through and ask those questions. And the other thing I would encourage them to do is that, you know, life Life is their canvas and you get to decide what you want to put on your canvas and you know it's this idea of going out and encouraging them to make their profession, their passion, and vice versa. So for me, I absolutely love commercial real estate, and I love trying to drive investment returns to my investors, and I love taking a vacant building and turn it into a business incubator or a charter oh, school cool. or whatever we're going to do with it and be rewarded for it. And so for me, I work very hard, but I really don't work because I love what I do. And there's nothing else that I would do on this planet other than helping to build my company and serve the community in the ways that we do. And so I would encourage them, make your passion, your profession, and great things will come from it. See, that's, that's, I, I was just talking to one of my friends um, yesterday about I, I don't necessarily believe in the work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's okay for, as long as you're not neglecting like your family. Yeah, yeah. But I, I very much, I'm kind of always working on something. I'm always going over something in my head. I'm yeah. always trying to, to figure out, okay, what, what if I did this? What, yeah. if, what if I did this? And, and I, I very much believe that um, as well. I don't, I don't necessarily turn it off. When I'm, yeah. when I'm up, I'm just me, and I don't know how to be other than me. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because in my book I do explore this idea. And to me, um, when you are tapping into your subconscious and you're always encouraging it to give you ideas and you actually act upon them, better and greater ideas are gonna come. So constantly throughout the day or the night or in the morning, I'm sending myself an email about an idea or mm -hmm. leaving myself a voicemail message or whatever it might be because we can act upon it. As Absolutely. an entrepreneur, there's nothing like thinking about something you know, in the evening and you know, following through on it the next day. Mm -hmm. Like literally, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, there is no floor and there's no ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of our ideas and capabilities. And the more that you can execute on them and to show that there's you know great resolve for it, uh, I really do think great things happen. It's a lot of fun. I, I I agree. One of the things I've encouraged a lot of young entrepreneurs to do is I say, you're going to think you're going to have a tremendous amount of ideas. A lot of people, actually most human beings on the planet, are idea people. Mm -hmm. um, it's the people who can take action on it. And the first yep. piece of action is if you're in the middle of the night and you wake up and you've got this idea, go write it down. Yep. Just write it down and just sketch it out just as fast as you can because I'll tell you more often than not, it'll keep me up if I'm thinking about it and processing it. But if I write it down, it's there. And then, unfortunately, more often than not, when I go the next morning and I look at my idea and I go, man, I'm glad I didn't think about that anymore because that is not a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny you say that because I think writing it down is a few things. You know, one, you commit it to paper and yeah. you can analyze it later. Two, you're freeing up your mind for other ideas and new space to be had versus trying to remember those seven things that you had a good idea on. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly doing that. You know, get it out there. You can always come back to revisit it. Mm -hmm. Not every idea is going to be, you know, mm -hmm. our golden idea, but just continue to think about them, formulate them, and then execute on the ones. And you know what I also encourage people, too, is that oftentimes, especially as entrepreneurs, it's not if you go right or left, it's going to make a huge difference. The mm -hmm. goal is to make sure you get down. In my book, I talk, liken it, I use a metaphor of going through moguls when we're skiing, right? Mm -hmm. We have to get down the mountain, and you're going to hit one mogul and go on to the next one and keep picking your lane down the mountain, and you got to make it down the mountain. Yeah. And to look at those ideas and those opportunities as just uh, obstacles and or things you need to overcome one of uh one of our guests um who is a really prominent businessman he uh i was asking him i said hey what is what is one takeaway that you would um and often it, it, past guests i'll ask i'll ask current guests what do you, what do you think about this idea and one thing that i thought was so interesting that he said is i said if there's one thing that you want to tell an entrepreneur he said okay i want you to tell them there is no such thing as a right decision no yeah. You just make a decision and then make that decision right. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that action first idea of, of 
no such thing as that good decision. You just got to kind of get it out there and start it and finesse it and guide it and, and, and do that. Yeah. Well, I would say, you know, for me, for, there's a, a moral part of it in terms of what is right and wrong. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, that aside, assuming you're making a moral, morally de- correct, decision, yes. correct decision, then saying, you know what, okay, I'm going to make a decision. And what I try to tell people, when you are going through life, no matter what it is, and you decide not to make a decision or take action, mm-hmm. You have made the decision. Absolutely. Right? Because you're not moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to say, okay, I'm going to make this decision and I'm going to realize, you know what? It's going to take its twists and turns and it's not going to be the ruin of me and it's not going to be make all things perfect, but it's a decision and it's moving the ball down the field. And we have to move the ball down the field as entrepreneurs because people are depending upon us. Absolutely. And the execution of our business, ideas, strategy, all of it depends on us actually taking action. Yeah. When I've, uh, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, young businesses or young kids and I'll ask them, I'll say, okay, I'll say, what's your dream? What's your goal? What's your wish? However they want to say it. And then I'll ask them why they haven't taken action on it. And it's, it's a myriad of a bunch of different excuses. And then I will ask them, I say, well, what are you more committed to? Are you more committed to your fears or are you more committed to your oh, dream? Powerful. Yep. And they just kind of sit there and, well, I mean, I'm more committed to my dream. I said, well, by not taking action, yep. the very definition of that means that you are more committed to your fears. And then the next day, I will see them taking action yeah, on their dream. I love it. And Good for you that you did that. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's the thing. I mean, action is so powerful. And I think, unfortunately, in today's social media um, day and age, I always say it's the land of peace because you're either saying, I'm perfect, check out my, my perfect friend or my perfect food or my mm-hmm. perfect car, perfect house, or it's the land of pity. Yeah. Um, my, here's my GoFundMe page. Here's my, uh, my, uh, my aunt has cancer. My mom did this. I, there's a, um, my landlord's going to evict me. It's, it's either perfection or pity. And neither one of them, when people are putting them out into the world, neither one of them are real. Yeah. Because it's never that perfect, and it's never that bad. It's just called life. Yeah. And uh, I love uh, um, oftentimes when, because I, I speak, I just got done with a big speech at uh, the, um, the uh, Center of Entrepreneurship at CSU. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they were, uh, they kept asking me, say, what does it feel like to be at the top? And, and uh, I, I'd like to touch on your, your story after this, because um, I actually moved to Denver nine years ago and I was homeless. Mm-hmm. And so I was trying to build myself up and they kept asking me, what's it like at the top? What's it like at the top? I'm going through all these hardships and I have this going and I have this going. And I say, okay, well, let's visit this idea. And I think life has the answer and God's given us Mm -hmm. the answer. And so I I had my assistant, I say, hey, pull up every picture that you can find of a mountain. And so we go through 20 pictures of a mountain. And uh, I say, okay, can everyone agree with me that all of these are, in fact, mountain, mountain peaks? This is the top of a mountain. And everyone says, yeah, I can, I can agree. I said, okay, so this is the peak. This is where everyone's trying to go. This is the top. This is the upper echelon of life. And they say, yeah. And I say, okay, cool. What's at the base of a mountain? And they say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, what's all this green stuff down here? Uh-huh. And they say, oh, well, that's the trees and the rivers. I said, okay, so instead of saying that you're not at the top yet, just say you're in your growth phase because mm-hmm. all the growth happens at the base of wow, a mountain. love it. And that's the big thing. Yeah. The essence of life is growth. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll, ask, I'll ask kids when we're, when we're going through it, and I'll say, okay, how tall does a tree grow? As tall as it can. Mm-hmm. How smart is a dolphin? As smart as it can be with what it was given. Mm-hmm. Okay, can you honestly say that you're as smart as you can be with what you've been given? Mm -hmm. And most kids are, oh, man, I've got some work to do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because I've traveled a good part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I try to tell people that I believe we as Americans have won the historical lottery of all time Mm. to live where and when and how we do in the United States of America. It's unbelievable. We're not perfect. We've got a lot of work to do. But, wow, we sure do have a good first step. And, Absolutely. And the question is, what are you going to do with that? Mm-hmm. And whether it's your time, your talents, or your treasure, trying to serve others. You know, I personally operate in three primary buckets. There's my business bucket, there's philanthropy, and then there's the political bucket. And for me, it's on a foundation of faith. And so, you know, I explore those with different people and to say, figure out what your buckets are. And, mm-hmm. you know, whether you're just, you know, giving an encouraging word to one person or whether you're 
quote unquote, climbing that peak that you're mm-hmm. going after, like really figure out what is your value and your worth and, and what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that's the only way to legacy is you living forever. Yeah. So if people are scared of, of the fact that you can't get out of this world alive, yeah. the only way to live forever is to make an impact on other lives. Mm-hmm. And how are you going to be remembered? That's yeah. why the bank of memories, I think, is so much more important than how many zeros you have because that can go up and down. But, I mean, the bank of memories is the only thing that just goes up. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I mean, money is a commodity. It comes and goes. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I always tell people, really focus on this pursuit of knowledge. And, yes. And, you know, I literally will travel around the country or the world to spend a few minutes with somebody that I want to get their golden nuggets of wisdom yes. from. And uh, and with that knowledge gives me the more ability to, well, create more wealth, but also to serve others and to love others and to continue to build that legacy. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think getting into what... One of the kind of principles in one of the books that I, I wrote was p- always push power towards power. So mm-hmm. many people, when they, when if, if whether it's a power in what someone can do for them or who they are to them, whatever it is, but right when someone feels power, in today's day and age, most people's I- initial response is to try to, how can I diminish their power? Mm-hmm. How can I take away from them? How can I detract from them? How can I get the focus off of them and what i've always i said i don't care what it is and everybody just to be super clear everybody on planet earth is powerful in something Mm -hmm. you go find that power and then you push them towards that power Mm -hmm. but in layman's terms it's just support one another yeah but to multiply power and to help do that is you have to have the proximity of power Mm -hmm. and that's the kind of the big reason for my podcast is because i have all these really cool people who I think are powerful speakers, powerful in business, powerful thought leaders, powerful just husbands, uh, power, powerful fathers, just p- so much power. And I was going, you know what? We live in this amazing day and age that the proximity to power can just be tuning into the right information on a podcast. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay, I'm going to go interview as many people as I can that I think are making a real difference. And then let's try to connect all the listeners to that way of thinking. Yeah. And that's similar to the reason why we founded the Opportunity Coalition. Mm-hmm. You know, I was blessed with knowing all of these different people had been successful in business or academia, nonprofit, whatever. And I said, you know what? There's golden nuggets we can learn from Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And I love bringing them in and, and seeing people just get benefit from it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I do believe that high tides raise all boats. I and, agree. And when you think about your podcast and the impact that it has just on one listener, and if they take one step forward towards their dreams... Um, good things will happen. Oh, I absolutely. absolutely believe it. So let's talk a little bit more um, about the harder times of Brian Watson. <laughs> when you were when when you realized, oh my gosh, I am a full blooded entrepreneur. I'm going to take the risks. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to have the sleepless nights. What are some of the things that you went through that maybe? shaped the person that's sitting across from me today? Yeah. I would say there's four primary points of my life um, that were the hard times. Uh, First, when I was young, my parents got divorced after Mm. 21 years of marriage, and that was just really tough on me. Uh, Second, when I was 16 years of age, my father or stepfather went away healthy in the morning, and he died that evening from an asthma attack. And I had to become the man of the house really quick, and that was really, really tough on me. Uh, Third, the down economy, which is the real essence of your question, which I'll get to, and that was the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, Mm -hmm. and trying to just to survive. And then I would say the fourth thing uh, is I got divorced a little over a year ago after 21 Mm -hmm. years of marriage myself. You know, I thought I'd be married the rest of my life, and unfortunately, uh, that wasn't in our cards. And so, but going back to your specific question about the down economy, Mm -hmm. you know, I mainly buy vacant commercial real estate, Mm -hmm. and the market just fell out around the country. You know, we were in some markets where there was over an 80% loss in value. Mm. And we went through that gauntlet. And I started with a lot of employees going into it. And I ended up just with a couple coming out of it. I've now rebuilt the company to over 40 employees uh, here in Denver and around the country. And so the lessons you learn are, you know what, 
uh, you got to just stick with it. I mean, you know, bankruptcy for me is never an option, and I'm going to do whatever it takes within legal means. And I worked a tremendous amount of hours just nonstop working with lenders and tenants and investors, and we fought through it. And after coming through it, our relationships are stronger and better mm. than they ever were before. Uh, did we take our nicks through it? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, you earn an MBA or two <laughs> through that process, <laughs> but nobody gave me a plaque or a piece of paper for it. But, uh, you know, if you can make it through those times, you can do even better uh, in the other times. See, that's it's it's very interesting hearing because we just interviewed Kyle, mm-hmm. and it's very interesting how much relationships are at the core mm-hmm. of the way that both of you talk. Absolutely, it's key, and, and it's just amazing how after one of the most tumultuous times a business can have, yeah. the first thing you say is our relationships are yeah. stronger. Not yeah. I made more money, not I have a great office or we have all this. My relationships are stronger. That's yeah. impressive. What really matters to me, you know, relationships are the key. In fact, one of my chapters in the new book is not location, 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 like you'd think a real estate person to say, but relationships, relationships, oh. relationships. And, um, you know, we haven't always done things perfectly, you know, but I've always tried to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And I've always tried to to reach out and, um, you know, put my investors first and put my employees first. And, um, you know, those are the kind of things that now when the bullets fly in life, uh, people know that I'm going to be in the trenches, I'm going to be out on the battlefield and taking the hits and doing what we need to. One of my favorite quotes is the Theodore Roosevelt quote about being in the arena, Mm -hmm. right? It's the people that are up in the stands that can hurl insults who have never been on the arena floor and don't know what it means to have be bloody and sweaty and tired. But we're always going to be out in the arena floor and we're always going to focus focus on relationships first and uh, whether we have much or little that mm-hmm. is what our focus is always going to be see that's that's awesome I think I think we should uh, come up with some sort of fun uh, Photoshop of Brian as a gladiator <laughs> <laughs> that says the real entrepreneur please stand up well, as I long l- as I don't have to show my legs or something like that in that picture but uh, but I'm all for it but oh, um, no it's 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 been a, a wonderful uh, experience and again you know we deal and some of our investors are some of the wealthiest people in the world literally mm-hmm. uh, we have a few of the top 100 wealthiest people in the world that invest with me to people of more modest means and everything in between. And I treat all of them the same. And I look them in the eye and just say, look, I'm going to do everything I can, uh, one, to protect your capital and two, to execute on it and try to get the best returns we can. We don't guarantee returns, but I will guarantee I'm going to work my tail off uh, for you and uh, and to build that long-term relationship. And people know that you know when I shake on something or I look somebody in the eye, it's as good as being done or being papered up. And uh, of course, we live in a world where everything has to be in yeah. Yeah, paper format true. and we need to do that but it's really important to me that my word is my bond and I won't always get it right but I'm always going to be committed to doing the right thing. See that's awesome. So if there's one big takeaway that you want someone to know from this podcast from who Brian is from who North Star is whatever it is but if if someone only listens to say the next 30 seconds to a minute of what what and who you are, what you represent, what would you like them to have? What is their takeaway? What do they take home? Yeah, well, for them, I would say life is an absolute blessing and a gift, and don't waste it. You mm-hmm. only have one shot, you know, and this idea of going out and serving others and living a life of legacy and love and service to others. As for North Star, um, you know, and Brian Watson specifically, uh, we're just getting started. We want to go out and have a positive impact. You can learn more about our initiatives at brianwatson.us. We love coming alongside people, and whether it be our community barbecues, the Opportunity Coalition, or taking a vacant building and creating jobs and opportunity, uh, we're here for a long time, and we really want to work and build collaborations with others. Oh, that's awesome. Well... Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation. I love your great work, so please keep it up. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been the Final Percent Podcast with Greg Kimball and Brian Watson of North Star Commercial Partners. He's pretty epic. And go to the website, find out more about what he's got going on.